So again, man, I, I, I would urge young people to avoid thinking that association presidents are ever going to lead them anywhere. I would really caution them to the idea of thinking they can ever solve a problem, no matter how innovative their individual program is. If we don't have a collective shift, you know, your program might get you know some awards and accolades, but at the end of the day, at the end of your life, and trust it from a dude who's been through 40 years of this. I'm proud of the work I've done, but DC Kitchen's about to have in January its 35th anniversary. Is that to be celebrated? Truly? You know, uh, you can make a case that sure, we've done badass shit, but is it right that an organization that collects leftover food and feeds poor people with leftover food? I mean, the, the, the models evolved tremendously, but you get my point. Is, is that success? You know, I say everywhere, the future is not how many pounds of food you move every year, but how much liberation you squeeze out of every ounce you get. Welcome to the Philanthropy Masterminds podcast, brought to you by DonorSearch, the show that takes you inside the lives of thought leaders, innovators, and changemakers in fundraising, philanthropy, and civil society. I'm your host, Jay Frost. Robert Ager is a visionary in the nonprofit sector. He pioneered the community kitchen movement with DC Central Kitchen, turning donated food into both meals and opportunities through a revolutionary culinary job training program. His initiatives, including founding board membership at World Central Kitchen with Chef Jose Andres, have produced over 350 million meals and propelled thousands toward self-sufficiency. His book, Begging for Change, now celebrating its 20th anniversary, made the case for a new model for the nonprofit sector, one he continues to advocate for today. I'm just grateful that you're willing to do this. You've got so many stories to tell, um, and the audience for this is you know, other nonprofiteers, but there's so much that, you know, kind of work that you've done and you've tried to get other people to do yep. um, that uh, they don't think about enough. So I thought we could probe some of those areas. And, yeah. uh, and in fact, you know, t next year, somewhere in the next six months is the 20 year anniversary of uh, my book, Begging for Change. And, you know, there's so much of that was the kind of the, the big giant moment of like, I want to seize this opportunity to try and say something about, you know, not only not just the work I do, but the 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 fact that we don't none of us work in a vacuum and the essential need for a larger strategy, which still eludes us. Talk about that a bit, because when you wrote that book, what were you what were you really hoping would happen as a result of the book? And do you see the change that you would hope to see now that you're coming on 20 years with that? Well, it's interesting at the time. You know, the D.C. kitchen had flourished um, and, and, you know, we were helping people replicate models around the country, um, you know, based on their circumstances. So they weren't McKitchens, but, you know, we, we, we were always open source and welcomed people to come and visit. But behind it was an intellectual principle that said every pantry, every food bank uh, then and now everything they distribute represents lost profit for all intents and purposes. The model and our entire charitable sector was based on the idea of whatever society doesn't have any use for anymore, give it to us and we'll redistribute it. But, you know, in, in, from my way of thinking, there was, uh, uh, you know, I, I went to a party when I was a kid and met this dude who, who was a futurist. And I'm like, dude, what's that? And he's like, hey, dude, it's not rocket science. It's just probability. You know, you see trends and you put them together. And I started really being intrigued by that idea. And one that I saw was that, you know, a culinary schools were opening all across America and they were generating um, graduates that were going to come into the same restaurants that donated food to me, armed with the latest um, uh, uh, kind of, a, a, you know, science and, and all the different things that were going to diminish the amount of food that was going to be donated. That was a, a given, you know, you can't throw away money forever. So there was that sense of shrinking supply. But at the same time, I became wildly aware of aging in America. Um, you know, back in 2002, um, I did a keynote speech for Meals on Wheels, where the CEO at the time revealed that there was a waiting list in half of American cities. And again, I just did the basic math on, on site. You know, wait, the baby boomers, first ones born in 1946, 1947, that means you still have four years before the first of 80 million baby boomers start getting old. And they're a generation that still had mortgages and credit card debt. So supply was going to, I mean, demand and supply were going to go like this, supply, demand. So that sense of we've got to do more. But at the same time, I became more and more aware as I traveled the country doing speeches, how 
And it was interesting, too, because it was the beginning of, of when people like Lester Salomon, um, who was at Johns Hopkins, who I really still greatly admire, even though he's passed and they've sadly closed down, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the, the operation he built. But people started to do economic studies on the role of nonprofits in the American economy. And I became really fascinated that, you know, here we were, you know, 14 million votes uh, within our ranks. Uh, three trillion in asset, uh, you know, half a billion in annual revenue, 60 million volunteers every year. Yet we had no say in the political process. Uh, and then on top of all that, um, in a moment of a bizarre kind of civic responsibility, I took over uh, as an interim uh, the CEO of the United Way in Washington, D.C., which was just crashing and burning before our eyes. And it was a $90 million a year fundraising apparatus because it included not just the United Way, but the combined federal campaign. And absolutely no one, I mean, literally people were just dancing around the bonfire and throwing chairs on it. You know, that it was it was a drunken kind of bacchanal in which I felt somebody had to stand up and say, you know, time out, we got to fix this. So I, I naively sent a, a note to the board chair saying, here's you know a couple of ideas that you ought to consider. And I got a call and within like 24 hours, they had asked if I would lead the United Way out of this kind of self-inflicted boondoggle they were mired in. So that really revealed something very, very unexpected, which was here was a moment in which they had literally given the keys to the car uh, to one of the recipients. I mean, this is a nonprofit stream come true if we were in charge of a foundation. And here I was saying, oh, my God, they gave one of us the keys to the United Way. Let's rebuild it. Let's get together as a sector and really imagine what it could be. And when I turned to my beloved community of Washington, D.C., I found that literally to a, a, a an organization, all the nonprofits had headed to the exit and were literally just saying, man, F the United Way, we're, we're, it's every person for themselves. And I, it shook me to my core because I thought, A, here's an opportunity for us. But B, what about all the donors that are that, are, that feel like, you know, they were betrayed? We, we, we have to, you know, heal them and get them back into a mood where they see us as a viable recipient of their hard earned money. So, you know, all those things together kind of led to what became begging for change. And uh, it's interesting, Jay, because the, the literally I wrote that. And submitted it to the publisher, HarperCollins, and went off to India for a month uh, to take a break. Uh, you know, I'd been in the I, I'd been almost 14 years at D.C. Kitchen, a year, a very arduous nine months at the United Way. And I just needed a break. And during the writing of that book, I, I had there was a footnote that that I noted, but it really stuck with me. And that's that the British. Uh, in India during their century and a half rule, never had more than 3,000 officers stationed on ground. And that really struck with me because it was the idea of, you know, we all grew up hearing about Gandhi and, and the, you know, the evolution of their revolution. Um, but that just struck me because, I mean, again, 3,000 white dudes on an entire subcontinent for a century and a half versus 300 million people. And of course, there's command structure and all that. But uh, I wanted to go off and figure out, you know, what you know? What allowed them to do that? And it was embarrassing because within about forty-eight hours of arriving, I was on the phone to uh, New York to HarperCollins begging for a delay in publishing. Just give me—I you know, just need thirty more pages to write an addendum because I realized that the British had just um, divided and conquered, and they had kept you know Sikhs battling Muslims, uh, you know, caste, geography, language, everyone fighting one another when uh, uh, they could have on any given day found common cause and thrown the British out. And I realized, oh, my God, I spent, you know, uh, you know, 200 plus pages getting frustrated by the nonprofit sector, only to realize that we are modern day Indians. We've been divided and we fight one another. Um, and, and I became fixated on this idea of a liberation movement for our sector based loosely on the nonprofit Congress or the independent. I'm sorry, the Indian National Congress. And that eventually came the nonprofit Congress. And but today it seems like, again, we still need that injection of conversation about this. It, uh, you, you had formed a group. I, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Uh, C, um, C Forward at yep. one point. Right. That also addressed this. And I, I don't know if it's still standing, but the idea that 
um, all these people working in the sector who are all kind of disaggregated and doing their own thing, kind of running away, like you said, instead could apply their their experience and their ideas to policy, which is still kind of a challenge. It is. Um, well, first and foremost, it's probably the greatest urban myth of our sector is that, you know, we can't be politically engaged. Now, theoretically, oh, I want to say theoretically, we are by IRS uh, you know, policy not allowed to endorse candidates. Uh, while our for-profit colleagues, thanks to Citizens United, have open abilities. And I think that should be challenged. But I accept that that's the current situation. Um, but there was an urban myth which kept the vast majority of the sector silently toiling in the fields of America. Um, secondly, the majority of our associations, which we think are the leadership groups for our vast network, whether it's independent sector, whether it's the National Council of Nonprofits, Council on Foundations, their trade associations. And the job of their leadership is not to lead their association presidents. And their job is to put on conferences and issue thought papers. So I spent a lot of time traveling America, speaking at these big gatherings, assuming that I was very good at getting their audiences fired up, but there was no one who was going to lead once I left. And I didn't have the infrastructure Uh, You know, I was just saying, in effect, I'm one of you. I'm just struggling to make payroll. But doesn't it dawn on you, as it has on me, that we have latent economic power that we should explore? Um, But it's interesting because, um, you know, all these different groups have have, in effect, thwarted real dialogue about our role. I mean, I I really do lay the blame in the associations in Washington, D.C., And their state counterparts, some state associations have been dynamic in their work, you know, Minnesota, California, Idaho, uh, in really trying to understand and and extol the uh, the economic impact of the sector. And you see individual groups doing Herculean work on policy. But again, the weight of our sector, I'll give you a good example. Um, Every single election cycle, you will see both parties covet and chase and solicit the endorsement of firefighters and police unions, right? They represent about, I think last time, 400,000 uh, uh, firefighters and and whatever. We're 14 million. There's 14 million people who work in the nonprofit sector. Yet when have you ever heard a candidate speak about us with any depth of knowledge, any sense of vision, uh, partnership, you know, anything? And I find that shocking. So, you know, like I said, I I really went around the country trying to get that going. But that eventually led to this idea of saying, "Okay, I get it, but let's try a different tact. And C4 was a a, a political action committee. And I put about 40, 60 grand of my own money speaking fees into that project saying, I'm going to get a bunch of interns and we're going to data mine the 2013, uh, uh, 12-13 election cycle. And we had three goals. Let's find any candidate who comes from the sector. You know, what the heck? Let's find people who come from our ranks. Secondly, let's find people who might have a real detailed policy plan on how they might partner with the nonprofit sector to create jobs and you know economic prosperity. And then finally, and most coveted was, can we find somebody who would actually appoint somebody to their cabinet whose job would be full time trying to partner with us to not only uh, attract more revenue, create more jobs, but actually evolve, incentivize and reward behaviors like we were practicing at DC Kitchen by creating social enterprises and buying local food and doing school food contracts and reinvesting profit. Help those evolve. Um, you know, that's a better kind of business than multinational food companies. So let's, you know, what are some of the policies that might get that going? Uh, but the idea was saying, look, don't give me the money. I, I understand, you know, the idea of just sending a check to Robert Egger and letting him decide. <laughs> All I'm going to do is put on a website all the different candidates who check one of those boxes. And there's 14 million of us. If we each just take a moment, go online, check them out, send them a buck. I mean, that's $14 million. Campaigns can go a long way on that. Let's just start to explore what that might look like. But um, I tell you, Jay, I think what you see, and and not only myself, but uh, you know, a gentleman I'm not really a big fan of, but nonetheless, I respect his ideas as Dan Pallotta. Uh, and Dan Pallotta, who had a very popular TED Talk, similarly tried to get the sector to recognize its its potential. Again, we disagree vehemently on you know what that potential could be exploited for, but we both tried to get the sector to activate. And Dan had by far much more juice than I did. I mean, he had you know millions of people watching his TED Talk and was 
commanding, you know, a pretty significant schedule of speaking engagements. Yet when te- when he tried to get people to do a, a walk to kind of uh, activate the imagination of the American public, he had, he had to close it. He couldn't get enough people signed up. So I really do believe that the sector's latent kind of timidity is something that really does need to be explored. And uh, I would just add, I'm sorry, I'm a little chatty here, but I would add that another avenue I've explored is I study independence movements. You know, I'm no scholar, but I try. Um, But I've been fixated on the Seneca Falls Convention, where women and abolitionist leaders came together for the first time in 1848 and talked about the idea and the nexus between women's suffrage and abolition. And it took 72 years between that first meeting and the 19th Amendment, which gave white women, and only white women, the right to vote, but nonetheless, big step. But in those 72 years, uh, if you really read, you realize that the Sojourner Truths, the Susan B. Anthony's, the Katie B. Stanton's of, of the world were, t- were trying to convince other women they had the right to vote, not men. They were trying to convince women that what they had been told all their life, whether because of their religions, whether because of the, the, the men in their lives or the larger society, wasn't true and that they did have these rights. And it took 72 years to convince that many women to kind of throw off the shackles of their combined subjugation. Uh, and grab for something that that rightly belonged to them. And I would make a case that the nonprofit sector is the feminized part of the American economy. 78% of our leaders and founders are women. And I think what we're going through is an extension of that same process of recognizing that the rules we've been told to play by, where we're supposed to be happy with the leftover money from the larger corporate society that gives through philanthropy, or whether we're supposed to be silent in the face of uh, obscene political movements that only make our jobs harder and that we have no say. Uh, and I think that the time will come where people will look back. Um, I think at people like myself and others who have challenged this orthodoxy and say, God damn, they had a point. I wonder why it took so long. I wonder if maybe if we had an idea about how you came to that point, if it might help others to to also get there, uh, since we can all see the problems, but for some reason, maybe many of us are feeling that timidity, or we don't feel that we have the power, or we don't think it's time, all those things which have interrupted movements before among the masses. Um, I'd love to go back a little bit, if you don't mind, to just figure out know. where did this, you know, today's Robert Eger come from? <laughs> so it, it starts quite a ways back. I don't know where you were born, but I know you were, I, I guess, working on a newspaper route in Occoquan. So you, you are from around this neighborhood. Where where were you born? I was born in Milton, Florida. My dad was in uh, aviation school. He was a uh, naval aviator, a Marine pilot. Mm. And that took us from, you know, all the different Marine bases back in the day of Cherry Point. And then, of course, Southern California, where I really spent my formative early years uh, in Southern California before moving to Quantico, Virginia, okay. uh, and then ultimately to Washington, D.C. Oh, Quantico, not Occoquan. Thank you for the correction. That's close uh, enough for rock and roll. <laughs> yes, if you're driving, it is. So you were in this neck of the woods, and and I guess that's that's how you eventually made your way. Um, I, it was natural to be able to drive down the street a little bit and then be part of the club scene. But how did that start for you? How did you? Well, it was, it was dude, you know, I, I use this, I talk about this all the time, but when you grow up in the 1960s and you're exposed to an insane amount of music that was really saying something, you know, there was a purpose mm-hmm. and you merge that with speakers, Dr. King, Malcolm X, you know, Bet, uh, uh, you know, Barbara Jordan, uh, you know, the, the whole litany, uh, uh, Shirley Chisholm, boy, there's people I just, my mind's flooded with people who were saying something. Um, You know, I I listened and I really early on chose the team I wanted to play on. You know, I wanted to be on 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 team change, team team justice. Um, And uh, but at the same time, I also watched some of those people killed for what they were saying or for the team they belonged to. And that really struck my young heart. You know, the idea of how could they kill Dr. King or Bobby Kennedy or anybody else who was only talking about, you know, how, how good our society could be. If we saw past gender and and uh, you know race and generations, and I became fixated watching at the same time uh, uh, variety shows, and suddenly you had kind of, uh, for lack of a better, we'll, we'll say integrated variety shows. Flip Wilson, 
Richard Pryor, you know, the Smothers Brothers, laugh in and comedy and music seemed to me a way you could convey really political ideas without maybe either alienating or 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 terrifying people who you just were just mired in fear. So I became fixated on the idea of courage and how do you inspire courage through music and theater and art and dance? Remember when you were a kid and the first time you saw To Kill a Mockingbird and you saw Atticus Finch and you're like, how do you inspire? And imagine all those people who left thinking when I grow up, I want to be like Atticus Finch. You know, how do you inspire that? So I, I started running nightclubs because I really pursued that idea of how could I create a club environment that wouldn't rely necessarily on the constant flow of bands that you hoped would draw people in, but that could uh, take inspiration from those variety shows and actually create your own kind of troupe, a la what Saturday Night Live became. And that's what I, I really aspired to. And I ran nightclubs for the longest time, but this also happened to coincide with the rise of homelessness. And interestingly enough, the rise of catering, um, you know, catering was kind of, there had always been catered events, but you know, uh, uh, with lobbying and a lot of the rules that changed in D.C., catering uh, and an insane amount of food and money being kind of squandered nightly at these parties. A lot of my friends who worked in nightclubs were had gone to work in catering. And, you know, at a party or two, I'd hear them complaining about the irony of throwing away mountains of food every night when there were homeless people on the street. Uh, and that really kind of became a little bit of a burr under my saddle. It kept I kept thinking about it. And eventually, after a night of volunteering to serve people who slept outside on steam grates all over the nation's capital, I kind of put the two together and suggested uh, naively uh, to my wife, hey, look, you know, uh, I'm running nightclubs, but, uh, you know, somebody ought to find a way to get all this food that's that's thrown away every night. But instead of just using it to feed the poor the next day, a better meal um, you know, the night we had gone out, it, it was raining in D.C. and people were outside in the rain waiting for a charity truck to drive up. Uh, and, Jay, this is a theme you'll find throughout my work is uh, I've said this many times, but that night I encountered traditional charity, which was based on the redemption of the giver, not the liberation of the receiver. And that liberation of the receiver is a big part of my work. So on the way home, thinking out loud about all that food, I proposed, you know, not only should we collect that food, but maybe start a culinary school for the homeless. And that way you could feed more people better food for less money, but also actively shorten the line by the very way you served it. That was um, that was definitely a, a rough time in the district. They were, oh, dude. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was. It was the district was broke. Uh, people love to hate on the district. They still do. Um, homelessness was uh, uh, confusing. Uh, to, to most people, you know, and and not just men who, for some reason, on the hierarchy, fe didn't didn't seem to generate as much emotion. But when you started seeing women and then families, it, it really struck a different chord. It shouldn't. It should always be wrong. But it did. Uh, I think for a lot of people. And that's I think, quite honestly, Jay, one of the reasons DC Kitchen did so well is we offered an alternative to the traditional kind of endless loop of, in, you know, well-intentioned charity. But charity that didn't do anything to really shift the paradigm. And what I was proposing, as much as it was mocked at first, um, was revealed very quickly to be a pretty efficient system for, again, getting men and women who were not right off the street, but had gone through programs in a place where they could be part of the solution versus perennial recipients of, of charity. And I think that really struck a nerve, which is why, if I may be so bold, I try to avoid prideful things. But when I look around the country and I see kitchens that I help directly or just indirectly by being open source and available to anybody who wanted our curriculum or our materials, um, you know, Second Helpings in Indianapolis, for example, just had their 180th graduation. And that's a byproduct of a bartender in Washington who dreamed of being part of a liberation kind of movement um, who did something that everyone told me could not be done and just slugged it out every day for decades in the basement of the biggest shelter, trying harder to make it bigger, better, stronger, better, uh, and being open source, um, that that's the ripples that went out. It was just that the byproduct of just dedicated, constant, seven-day-a-week work. You said mocked. Why was the idea mocked? 
Well, A, the first was a little bit more understandable, and that was the an, another urban myth, and I've constantly tried to challenge urban myths, was that you can't donate food. It's illegal. And it's never, ever, ever been illegal. And another one of my prideful moments is I was very involved with many others in getting the Bill Emerson Act in 1976, not just passed, but I went to the White House and saw Bill Clinton sign it, which was the first national food donor law that said, again, there's never been a law, but nonetheless, from here on out, unless it's a case of gross negligence or malicious intent, you will not be held liable if you give food to a registered charity. Um, so I understood that. And I was armed with a lot of tactics that you know tried my best to kind of defang that myth. But the other one that really struck me, and I heard it from the charities that I went to, um, the different homeless groups who suggested that I was naive as a volunteer to think homeless men and women could work in restaurants. You know, um, and and again, people were really pretty overt in their sense of uh, we 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 appreciate your your intentions but you're naive. Uh, and that just, again, that really shocked me because I was a volunteer just trying to help. And here were, here were organizations that literally looked a volunteer in the face and said, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, we know what's best. And that just shocked me. Um, so A, the DC kitchen was born because no one else would do it. But I swore on day one that I would work as hard as I could to avoid becoming that person. Um, because I had, I looked at so many of those nonprofit leaders, and I still do. And, you know, none of them, not one of them looked in the mirror when they were 20 and said, man, when I grow up, I'm going to be a boring bureaucrat that stifles innovation. Yet the sector is full of people who have somehow devolved into something they swore they'd never be. And I'm fascinated by that. And I think, Jay, that's part of the discussion we should have. Uh, and, and you could make the case that the system as it's designed beats people down, you know, fighting each other for money constantly in the pit of philanthropy, um, you know, the kind of, you know, going up against this enormous wave of poverty and homelessness and despair and, and addiction that we're supposed to confront with leftover money. Um, and, you know, what you know, all the different things that we get donated, you know, that that would beat anybody down. So the question becomes, how do we lift ourselves up individually, but collectively, and, and again, become uh, daring and brave, which I think is at the very beating heart of what the nonprofit sector is supposed to be about. The part that's so difficult about that, perhaps, is that we're in this constant battle for a few dollars in order to keep the lights on. I, you just alluded to that with this kind of a fierce competition um, uh, uh, for dollars among the organizations. Maybe that causes them not to work in the collaborative way that they could if they were really pursuing the dream that they saw in the mirror when they were 20. So I wonder, what do you see as some of the potential ways that organizations can stop looking at one another as competitors and start thinking about each other as collaborators towards single visions where they can generate enough revenue, earned revenue as well as contributed revenue to actually take a bite out of some of these problems, like the way DC Kitchen did. Well, this is, again, part of the evolution of thought I went through. Um, you know, again, I try, I try, you know, one thing and it's like, well, that didn't work. Let's try another. So one of the things I started experimenting with was this idea of saying, look, um, if you and I, you had Jay's dry cleaning and I had Robert's dry cleaning. And every morning I turn the corner and I I wish that Jay's dry cleaning had burned down in the night <laughs> or you know, if I saw you being taken out in handcuffs because it was really Jay's fencing operation, I'd be thrilled. But if some legislator wanted to propose legislation that threatened um, us as small businesses from competing or earning money to take care of our families, we might not get in the same car, but we would go down to the Chamber of Commerce or the Board of Trade and we would uh, put aside our differences, legitimate as they may be. We would put them aside for a day and work side by side collectively to try and thwart that legislation. The nonprofit sector has really no such mechanism. Um, and we don't see ourselves that way. You know, again, we've been told, uh, again, that we are not businesses. We are charities uh, for so long that I think we've internalized this sense of we don't have those same rights. So that's one thing I, I've really talked about is that idea that just because I, I, I tend to speak about a unified effort, I don't do mean every single day of the, of the year, 
you know, a lot of us aren't good and do deserve competition. I love competition. But let's talk about that. Wouldn't it be interesting? And I'll give you another interesting example of a policy I think would be revolutionary. Um, If in 1986, when Bill Gates took Microsoft public, if you had invested $1,000, you would have one point something million today on this one small investment. But if in 1986, you gave Muhammad Yunus, who is the Nobel Peace Prize winning founder of the Grameen Bank, which has elevated the better part of 100 plus million people, primarily women out of poverty with small loans, all you would have been eligible for was a one-time tax deduction because you gave to a charity. Now, imagine a, a, a policy in which we tinkered with the tax code and said, if a nonprofit can show verifiable economic return, we will allow ongoing and growing tax deductions based on their rate of return principle. It is, it is just an algorithm and it's basic math. And there are ways you can actually find ways to quantify art, you know, a uh, faith, these things, but we've never tried that. But think about it. That is literally just somebody saying, let's tinker with the tax policy. Because right now, the only way to attain wealth in America is property, a pension, um, hard work, I guess, um, or stocks. Um, and when you think about stocks in Wall Street, that's big companies. But imagine if donating to a DC Central Kitchen, for example, or any one of a number of hundreds of thousands of charities that have a verifiable economic return. Imagine if you could get wealthy donating to charity or not. You could attain wealth. Let's put it that way. And imagine how that would um, incentivize. You wouldn't say, for example, to a traditional soup kitchen, you don't get a tax deduction anymore. No, you get the same one, one time tax reduction because you gave to a, just a nice charity every day doing their work. But imagine if if the average consumer had the ability to channel their 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 donations into organizations that were diminishing demand. Um, imagine the revolution that would lead to if if innovation was rewarded. Because right now, Jay, which I used to get frustrated, and you've seen this. Uh, people would give DC Kitchen money. And, you know, two years later, they'd say, well, you know, you all are doing great now. I'm going to give it to another group. And it'd be like, no, let's stop for a second. If, if I was if, if, if I was a, a company and you were, you were buying my stock and every year your revenue went up because I'm doing such a good job, would you take all your money and invest it in another startup? Or would you at least continue to support a proven winner? That's not the model in our sector. Um, people love the brand news. So, um, you know, that idea of how do we how do we not just you know secure our own futures, but find a way that incentivizes the evolution of the sector, which I think is essential. But, dude, at the end of the day, this all demands that we elect a generation of people who see us as active, equal partners in the economy of America. We're the third biggest employer, dude. That, to me, is shocking that candidates, and we're talking about every level, city council, mayor, governor, senator. Dude, seriously, you know, I I, I would love if people who are listening, if you've got examples, but I, I hunt and I find seldom does anybody ever mention the nonprofit sector in their vision for their community? And to my way of thinking, if you're talking about that you want to lead a community and you can, you don't have a plan that includes your third biggest employer, as well as one of the major sources of investment dollars in your community, dude, you're not fit. So I just think we need to own that and start to um, lovingly, respectfully, but urgently um, demanding of every candidate who runs for office a plan that includes us. It seems like, if anything, it's gone the reverse way. That, that not only is there no conversation about it, but uh, the kind of tribalism of politics leads to candidates who are really more about you know the color of the sweatshirt they're wearing than any kind of specific policy prescriptions. And maybe that's one of the reasons why people are so enervated by politics. But but uh, but I wonder if there is space within our current politics for candidates to rise up and to say, no, I I support essentially uh, social good, that I'm here to provide uh, an avenue for organizations to do better and to be incentivized to do better and for people to support those organizations. Are, Are you getting a sense that there's an appetite for that at a local level in the country anywhere? Is it, is it starting to rise in California, for example, versus back here in the East? 
Well, what's funny, dude, is, you know, I started, uh, I did this thing in New Hampshire in 2007 and 2008, where I went up and bird dogged every candidate. And I had a lot of great partners on the ground up there, including the New Hampshire Center for Nonprofits. But uh, I, along with a collection, a small ragtag army, we we bird dogged every single candidate. And it was shocking how few had any. And we just asked, in effect, first, can you tell us a little bit about your own personal experience with nonprofits? And some of them, shockingly, and, and again, John McCain, rest his soul, was one who was like, I can't think of any. And you'd look and you'd like, do you go to church, dude? Do you belong to an association? You know, uh, and it's just but that's how um, limited I think the average uh, electeds view of our sector is. You know, they they really view us as a ragtag collection of good deed doers versus the third biggest employer in America. Now, of course, I really want to, uh, you know, remind your listeners, we're talking about the spectrum all the way from Harvard University down to, you know, D.C. Kitchen. But nonetheless, it's the same as the the uh, when when the Chamber of Commerce in, in the U.S. or um, any federal agency talks about job growth in America. They're talking about the same widespread of big corporations down to mom and pops. So, you know, that that shouldn't be that shouldn't uh, limit our ability to imagine a collective voice. Um, but, you know, um I really don't. I think what's what's tragic is I think the average person in America, let alone elected person, has somewhat of a bifurcated lens where they think dot com um, businesses drive the economy. Well, dot org charities don't pay taxes and are socialist do gooders. And of course, as you and I both know, and a classic example of why nonprofit unity could be elusive is it's difficult to pick an issue in which the sector wouldn't be revealed to be just as divided as the rest of America. It's not as if, uh, you know, the nonprofit sector, whether it's, you know, right to life or immigrant immigration, we're just as divided. So part of the theory I was working under was trying to find things that did unite us. You know, the fact that uh, low administrative overhead remains the the moronic, uh, you know, kind of barometer of what's a good nonprofit. We get no media coverage, even though, again, when it comes to whether it's volunteerism, uh, you know, I find it fascinating that Americans give almost half a billion dollars uh, every year to charity, yet there's no page dedicated to where what's what's a good nonprofit. You know, how do you make a good investment in a nonprofit uh, uh, in your community or where do you volunteer? You know, we have a million pages will say where to go get a good cheeseburger, but nobody will say, you know, if you want to feed your spirit, you know, here's where you'll get a really great deal. Um, so I, I think what you have is a, a generation of politicians who were afraid that if they say I heart nonprofits, their um, opponent might accuse them of being soft on crime or blah, 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 you know, any one of a million socialist ridiculous comments. And I would challenge somebody to say, you know, literally, if any candidate asked me right now for a winning strategy, I would say uh, I would stand in front of a giant audience and say, hey, by the way, if you work at one of any of the thousands of nonprofits in this city, this state, this country, I want to be your partner. If you're on the board of any nonprofit in this city, county, region, I want to be your partner. Uh, if you volunteer at a nonprofit, I respect your work. I really love what you contribute and I want to help. You've just you've really just um, captured a big hunk of the electorate right there with a very simple pledge that you see them. You understand the role they play and you want to partner with them. Um, it would be the equivalent of standing up and saying, how many of you all hate school food? If you elect me, I'll improve it. These are just certain things that are, are universal truths, you know, that, that will get you elected if you say that. It strikes me as kind of funny in a way because uh, or, you know, people in politics, especially elected officials, sometimes do directly benefit. So they should see this when they help. So I think it was even with the inauguration, the Bush inauguration, you know, helping D.C. Central Kitchen. Um, and you just mentioned, uh, of course, that 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 law being signed by Bill Clinton. Um, now, of course, they sometimes do other things that confuse us. I mean, the Clinton administration uh, was also responsible for or during that time for, of course, 
uh, the, the welfare, welfare reform act. As we know it. Yeah. So it's uh, they're, they're, it's complicated, but they should be able to see the correlation between you know making it possible for DC Central Kitchen to get some more resources and feed more people, and and and, not, and maybe more importantly, enable them to take charge of their lives, um, than uh, than than not doing so or ignoring the sector. Um, but you've you've uh, with DC Central Kitchen, um, of course, that's populated now across the country and around the world with World Central Kitchen. So you've seen how these things can also uh, take on a life of their own and be very successful and kind of counter all these impediments we're talking about. What is it that's made that so successful? Well, you know, Jay, it's funny. I, I go back to that idea of how do you not become the beast you set out to slay? You know, how do you avoid becoming that boring bureaucrat? And so throughout my career, I wanted to do things that at first, um, were, you know, it was kind of a chuckle line, but I'd oftentimes say whatever traditional nonprofits do, I do the opposite. Um, so we were always, we were open seven days a week. We said yes to virtually anything, which included hundreds uh, of visitors every year who wanted to come and see what we were doing. Uh, we were open source, which meant, you know, anything that we were lucky enough through a variety of different understandable advantages I had being a white dude in Washington, D.C. at the birth of the Internet and cable and the Food Network and celebrity chefs, I felt obligated to share that. Um, so there was that sense of, of I'm not going to try and control knowledge. I'm going to give it away for free. Secondly, one of my big theories is that leaders don't create followers. They create other leaders. And while that did ultimately in, in every experiment I've led lead me to the conclusion that it was time for me to split, uh, because if you do your job well, you don't hang around forever. You've created other people who embrace your idea and make it their own and reinterpret it in ways that take it to the next level. So while I'm honored beyond measure to have friends like you know Mike Curtin, who's the CEO of DC Kitchen, and Jose Andreas, who's uh, the kind of chief food officer at World Central Kitchen. Um, and I am lucky because they keep my kind of legacy rippling on. But that's an example of, of each um, I had to let go and not try and control what they did or how they thought. It was like, no, this is the best thing in the world. Other people like the idea. Let them own it. And I think too many of our sector tries to control knowledge, profit off knowledge. Uh, and I just don't. And of course, I'm lucky. I, I really always have to acknowledge I had the benefit. I had so many benefits others wouldn't have. But that being said, I think there's a lot to be said for that idea of, you know, how do you kind of, for lack of a better word, radicalize your followers uh, so that they became they become badass leaders in and of themselves. Where, where is this journey taking you more recently? I mean, you left DC Central Kitchen. You went out to found I know LA the Play Kitchen, but, um, but which was lots of six years. Um, yeah, man, I was 55 uh, and 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 decided to do it all over again. And I, I really took on something that I think is still essential, but I, I have to admit, I think I was way too early in the curve, tragically, because it isn't it isn't too early in the curve. But I really embrace this idea of we have to find a solution uh, and, and, and innovation around senior nutrition. I go back to our earlier conversation about Meals on Wheels, mm -hmm. and that really stuck with me. And that idea of how do we feed more people better food for less money? Um, and I became fixated on this idea of it, L.A. would be the ideal spot. You know, I grew up there. Um, it had an unlimited supply of fruits and vegetables. It had an incredible variety of, of immigrant stories and recipes that you could mix and match and really create new flavor profiles. You had incredible schools to partner with there. We did, the 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 I think, the most intelligent and daring work I've ever done in my life. But it was it was designed to be a social enterprise that would compete for contracts to serve the elderly in Los Angeles vis-a-vis uh, -vis city contracts, the same way D.C. Kitchen had contracts to do D.C. public school food. Um, but I found the the process there uh, uh, corrupt, you know, in the in in in, in tragically, uh, and more importantly, the the larger way in which food contracts are meted out in America needs desperate over, over you know uh, uh, overhaul um it's it's still based on a a, a very non-transparent process in which i think people get away with a lot of corruption under the guise of uh, of we can't talk about it because it's a it's a backroom kind of process but more importantly it's still 
basically derived by who is the lowest bid. You know, who who basically says I can do it the cheapest. And I think what you're seeing, and I'll give you an example of the leadership. When I was there, even though I wasn't going to be involved in L.A. County, I actually worked very diligently uh, with a group of other nonprofits there to get the first piece of legislation passed in which there was a registration process for social enterprises like L.A. Kitchen. And you got certified based on a variety of metrics. Uh, you know, how do you source your food, uh, uh, environmental uh, issues, pay, reinvestment. But, you know, the idea was that they were going to go from low bid to best value. What's the best value of our money? And I think that's that's an experiment that really should expand. But after six and a half years, sometimes, dude, uh, and even uh, it's something that we should talk more about in our sector is sometimes things don't work. And sometimes you got to throw in the towel and just say, man, I gave it the old college try. And I had a lot of great, loyal partners who lost money. Uh, but it was that sense of like, man, I tried and I'm 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 just beat. Um, as Gladys Knight said, you know, L.A. proved too much for the man. I took that <laughs> midnight train uh, and it was at that moment that I really decided at age 61 that um, I had, had a great run. And that I really want to dedicate the re- I really wanted to dedicate the rest of my time, not career, my time to being a servant to a younger generation. And so I've kind of embraced this uh, self-given title of elder ally, uh, saying, in effect, I'm very lucky. My wife and I, we live simply and simply live. So uh, with that kind of humility, I have the ability to be free and available to young people. Uh, and I find that to be very filling. I have two more calls today after our chat with young people who just want to say to an older dude, what do you think? You know, do you have any thoughts? And I'm happy to play that role, dude. I mean, I, I think that's that's the job of every generation. And I think too few in our sector and too few organizations in our sector have the maturity at times to stop and say, I had a great run, uh, but it's a new generation's time. And it's time for me to step aside and let a new generation have their say. Uh, and I, I've had many advantages in my life, but I think that's one of the greatest advantages I've ever had is the ability to have wide open eyes and, and recognize when it's the time. As Keith Richards saying, you know, walk before they make you run. You know, I, I, I really enjoy this time of my life. What's the most fun part of it being the elder ally? Dude, the fact that young people still give a fuck about what I think. Uh, you know, to be quite honest with you, most most men my age rant and rave. You know, I did that 20 years ago. Wow, you know, wow, 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 wow. And, you know, I've got both, I mentioned earlier, Mike Curtin and Jose Andreas out there every day taking my ideas to the next level and still pointing at me to their credit. I mean, I give them so much credit and I give them so much love for that, that loyalty and friendship they've continued to offer me. Um, but that idea that, that, Young people still want to talk about, you know, what are what are some of the hurdles I I hit and, and how can they avoid them? Because that's really what I'm trying to do is not say do what I did. Let me tell you what I did so you can repeat it. I'm trying to say here are some hurdles I encountered, and this goes very much to the heart of our conversation today. You know, how do you how do you help elect or influence an elected person so they really see not just your individual program, but our sector differently. You know, how do you how do you influence somebody to see social enterprise as the ace in the deck they didn't know they had when it comes to local contracts? You know, how do they um, start to see uh, elders in their community as the deepest well of life experience in the history of the world that are just looking for a way to stay active and engaged and still make a difference in their life? Uh, and most importantly, how do they see a nonprofit sector that's itching for a partnership with local government? Um, that really treats them as equals to business and offers them opportunities beyond begging for change. So as you uh, have these conversations with some of these younger folks, are you hopeful? Do you get the sense that these are the kind of people who, to go back to what you said earlier, when they look in the mirror and they see what can be, that they aren't going to just turn into the bureaucrats that we've seen some others turn into? Well, I, I do think, Jay, that there is an opportunity. I've always said, man, if I really wanted to make some money, I'd write a I'd write a book saying, you know, how I started a famous nonprofit and learned to let go. And I can teach you in five easy lessons. Uh, you know, it, I, I'd get a job at every conference in America because our sector does need um, a, a, a kind of lessons in how do you let go? 
dude, I'll be honest with you. And again, I have different economic circumstances than most, but I see way too many of our generation who not only won't let go, but they won't allow for younger people to have a say. And I just think that's understandable because it's fear. I, I won't be relevant anymore. I'm not, I won't be needed anymore. What, what, what'll happen to my paycheck? Uh, what will I say to people when I go to a party, when they ask, what do I do? These are all understandable fears, but let's confront them. Let's, let's, uh, I just think that, that there are so many opportunities at our conferences in which you and I have been at many to go beyond the idea of cheapest insurance and a variety of other kind of inane conference topics to really talk about leadership and, 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 and advocacy. Because at the end of the day, until we um, usher in a new generation of elected leaders who have a different construct of economic growth in America, we will be mere servants in the fields. Um, we will be tolerated, but never heard. Uh, and I think that that is where we need to become masters of our own fate. Um, so again, man, I, I, I would urge young people to avoid thinking that association presidents are ever going to lead them anywhere. Um, I would really caution them to the idea of thinking they can ever solve a problem, no matter how innovative their individual program is. If we don't have a collective shift, you know, your program might get, you know, some awards and accolades, but at the end of the day, at the end of your life, entrust it from a dude who's been through 40 years of this. I'm proud of the work I've done, but DC Kitchen's about to have in January, it's 35th anniversary. And is that to be celebrated? Truly? You know, uh, you can make a case that sure, we've done badass shit, but is it right that an organization that collects leftover food uh, uh, and feeds poor people with leftover food? I mean, the, the, the models evolved tremendously, but you get my point, is, is that success? Um, you know, I say everywhere, the future is not how many pounds of food you move every year, but how much liberation you squeeze out of every ounce you get. Well, that's it for this episode of the Philanthropy Masterminds podcast. Thanks very much to our sponsor, DonorSearch, the world leader in fundraising intelligence, and of course, our producer, Jack Frost. If you like what you heard today, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, the DonorSearch YouTube channel, or wherever you like to listen. And consider giving us a like and a positive review so others can find us too. Check out our live webinars and webcasts on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and come back next Friday for our next interview with another leader in the world of social good. Until then, this is Jay Frost. Thanks for joining me. See you next time.